it's likely once sites are fully mobilized that we'll see um, like a bottleneck of, of uh, development loans which are coming to the end of their term. Um, what are you doing now as brokers to try and kind of mitigate that bottleneck and especially if there are fewer kind of um, lending options, um, fund funding options available? I, th I think, um, you know, the, 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 the first two weeks of um, the kind of the coronavirus shock that hit the market, what, one of our, um, one of our kind of biggest jobs has been um, working with our clients and the loans that we put in place, historic loans we put in place and, um, and arranging conference calls, video calls, uh, up in communication, having dialogue between um, the two parties, so the borrower and the lender, and working really on a, a strategy um, that works for both on a, at the moment, a kind of best guess um, assumption. Um, and I've got to say, you know, every, every lender that we've, we've, we've had these discussions with or, or chaired, chaired discussions with um, have, have been really forthcoming. Um, I, I, I think it's it's been um, it's been quite satisfying to see um, the way that lender and borrower have been working together. Uh, I think it's clear this is a, a, an issue that hasn't arisen because someone hasn't done their job properly. Um, it's uh, from you know a worldwide um, disaster uh, that no one really saw coming um, and because of that, the willingness to help and adjust where required to ensure people can fulfill their task tasks has been really accommodating yeah i think i think ed's covered it pretty well there um you know we're not dissimilar to lenders at this this point where where a lot of lenders are reviewing their loan books we're, we're reviewing our client books um to ensure that the developments that we've put in place are, are there or thereabouts on track or if there is a delay how can we manage it is there a shortage of funding if there is how are we going to cover it when the market returns is there a case of having those conversations now um, i mean yesterday i was talking to a client who's um who's drawn quite a big loan recently and uh, he was saying there's going to be a gap of uh, of a couple of million how are we going to fill that you know so so I guess to answer your question, it's all about being proactive and experienced enough to be able to foresee where the problems may or may not arise uh, and having those conversations and understanding, you know, is it a cash flow position? Is it, you know, a, a case of um, the goods not coming on time? Is it going to be a delay? Is it a time to pick the phone up to the lender at this point? Um, so it's, it's more about preemption, review and understanding what clients want, managing that expectation and allowing them to have solutions. You know, in our business, uh, it's okay to spot a problem and it's okay to have a conversation, but the most important thing is to have a solution. And, and I guess that's, that's what Ed and I and the team are doing at the moment is to, to you know, reviewing the client book, looking for, for the potential issues and finding the, the solutions that, that hopefully come with that. Um, I'm sure um, the next question is going to be um, something which lenders want to know um, the answer to. Um, Michael, uh, once a site is is fully mobilised, um, if a lender asks for a new valuation, um, how would a value assess the project if they are in unknown territory? I think that's a very um, it's a very challenging um, question because we are in uncertain times. You know that valuation. Um, as we know, is um, it's an art, not a science, um, and, ef and effectively, the, the, from the, the the development side, these are primarily driven by residual valuation, and residual valuations run by the GDV less the cost, allowance for risk, etc. Um, currently, assessing a GDV is is quite difficult, um, in that you know transaction levels are down, although having said that um, within um, within London um, Savile's new development team we've got probably about 40 450 475 um, live transactions off plan sales um, they've only lost 12 currently which is quite an amazing uh, statistic so that gives a degree of confidence to the um, the valuation process 
um, you also have to take into account when these projects are going to be delivered. And something that is at PC today is likely to be greater, or the impact will be greater than something that's going to reach PC in two or three years' time. Um, you know, the valuer isn't um, judging or preempting any fall in the market. Um, and if you, you know, I mentioned earlier on, if you've got a five-year uh, scheme, our forecast is sort of saying the market will be. 15% higher over that period. So would you necessarily be impacting a GDV at, at that time scale? If you had a scheme that was uh, pc today, then yes, you've got to look at historic um, evidence, most of which will be pre, um, pre-COVID. Um, and then you have to sort of stand back and make a judgment and look at, look at sentiment. So it could be that there would be a small current deduction um, in GDV uh, value, possibly, you know, 5-10%. Um, but in reality, most schemes at the moment are not being hit on the, on the GDV from a valuation perspective, uh, because valuations tend to be looking backwards as opposed to looking forwards. What's important to uh, advise clients, particularly um, uh, uh, the, the banks and the lenders um, is 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 the wording around those reports, and you know currently we are in them very in uncertain times. Uh, transactional volumes are probably going to be down anything between twenty five up to probably forty five uh, percent, and that and that will have an Im, uh, an impact. But what we probably don't see is a significant. Um, fall in value at the current uh, at the current time because transactions are still happening and in, if you look at second hand um, uh, ha- housing stock um, we probably had a mixed bag there some deals have just fallen past um, others have put them on on hold but where that where there have been price neg- uh, renegotiation um, those have been relatively minor, and you could call them insignificant in the scale of the transaction. Um, so, so it's quite it's quite difficult. But fu- fu- fundamentally, you know, you go back to the GDV which we would assess, and then within the the residual, you know, we would be um, pushing out um, the cash flow to, to to reflect delays in the uh, the supply chain and possibly delays in, in sales. But again, it would depend when PC is actually occurring. Um, can, I, can, I just add, can I just add one, one, one thing? Actually, it's a, it's, it's a question. Don't you think the price action is going to be a laggard in a certain way? And so it's, it's, it's in a certain way, it's deceiving to look at price action now, but we'll have to see it in, in, in six to 12 months time to actually judge what the, the impact is on, GD, on GDP. I, I would totally agree with that, but the difficulty is we, we don't have the benefit of waiting 12 months. You know, if, we, if we have to put a number on something today, you have to make uh, an assessment uh, and form an opinion. You know, evaluation is, is an opinion at the end of the day. Um, I think what you, you have to sort of perhaps do is say, okay, well, what was it worth pre-COVID? Um, so you have a, a, a straight line in the line in the sand and then you can look at all sorts of different sensitivities you can get cost inflation um supplier delays delays in the marketing um pushing back the cash flow um but as as dan said earlier on it's you've also got to reflect the fact that you know perhaps they're not spending uh, millions or tens of millions of pounds a month uh, because the site's on hold so it's complicated and you have to look at all these things so but i do think having a, having evaluation pre covid gives you a line in the sand from which you can then make an assessment and and, and dan and other uh, lenders can can look at their lending criteria based on um something that was relatively solid and then you then you can play with sensitivities um, out of interest, Nicolo, how will this um, impact you putting together business plans, costings um, when you when for future projects? Um, if the GDVs are unclear, as as Michael said, 
Well, I think I'm, I'm still very far away from, from putting business plans together for the simple reason that every time I do an assessment of a land value that I want to buy, uh, my value is about 50% of what actually the sellers want to sell it at. So I think before we come to an agreement on those terms, I think um, several, several months will, will come by. Uh, on the other hand, we have a different strategy in place in the moment where we've raised capital with, for bulk buying in the distressed market of new home sales. So we're kind of a, a gamekeeper turned poacher in a certain way. And what we can see is that uh, pre-COVID, there weren't that many developers that wanted to chat with us um, for substantial discounts on substantial bulk sales. Um, all of a sudden, they're coming out of the woodworks in the last two weeks. So that intimates to me that actually people that were, uh, this is, this is also um, not just in the high end, this is also at the you know, 500 to 1,000 pounds a, a foot. Uh, they're starting to be much more pragmatic. They realize that sales are going to be uh, much slower than they, than they expected. And that they are entertaining bulk sales at significant discounts that they were not doing before. That's why I'm bearish on the price action in the next 12 months, because if that starts happening and those, and those uh, um, transactions start printing, it, you know, it, will, it will create a different expectation for buyers in general in the market. Uh, and Michael, just just to add, um, with uh, some lenders have come out and said that they won't um, they won't lend if if a valuer has put the kind of material uncertainty clause into their valuations at the moment. What impact will this have on the market? Because how long will valuers be putting that clause into their reports? Well, I, I think the, the material uncertainty clause is is always a a, a hot a hot topic, and and this uh, time round is is no different. Um, the way this sort of arises is that the major firms sort of get get together in a call in, in association with the the RICS, and it's agreed uh, across the industry that the clause will be um, uh, utilised. Um, when will we stop using that? Um, COVID will have to have been, um, you know well and truly sorted out one would imagine and an uncertainty would be need to be taken away from the um the market um we found that some uh, lenders um will not lend at all if that um clause is in evaluation um, but many will and i think it's a case of uh, understanding what it's there for and it goes back to the the scenario of valuing a development whereby you can say, okay, well, let, let's start with the position of assuming COVID hasn't happened, draw a line in the sand, and then make an a, allowances going, going forward, reflecting what evidence is available and what sentiment is currently in the market. You know, we talk to our agents all the time. Um, so that, that, that's, a, that's a challenge. But um, I don't know, Dan, do you, what's your policy on the... the you know, we you see one of our valuation reports, and do you instantly move the LTV by ten percent, or um, you know, fifty bips? What, what do you do? Well, we we, we normally arbitrate uh, a debate between you and the borrower, Michael, as you know. <laughs> um, I'm I, I think on the valuation point. I mean, you're you make a point on some lenders won't proceed if there's a COVID-19 clause on there. And I think that you know, being a bit controversial here, um, I think if a lender, this may be a construction lender or a higher leverage lender, if they are lending entirely based on the red book valuation, then, then that's probably not a sensible underwriting basis for them to be lending off. You know, the, These are used as guides to assist with the assessment of risk. And if a lender is you know, experienced, and here for the long term, then they'll use that valuation to understand the risk, um, you know, rat ratify the business plans of the developer and the borrower, um, and use it as a tool for pricing. But you know, it, that that shouldn't be the sole decision for lending, in in my view. And I think that you know those lenders who come along um, without the necessary skills are are are, are you know potentially not not great for the marketplace because you know they, they can cause some problems and i'm sure ed and matt will be able to to comment on this in a second but you know from a policy point of view you know whether that 
clauses in there or not, you know, we'd be picking up the phone to you, Michael, and your team and, and having a discussion and saying, you know, let's challenge some of the assumptions, let's talk about it, let's look at the comparable evidence, right? We understand it's difficult because you've got reduced comparable evidence. You can't you can't be as certain as you can another time. So but that's okay. You know, we can form a view, we can assess the risk and then we can make the decision whether we lend or not. Well, I think that's the, the most important factor, isn't it? Um, understanding and assessing the, uh, the risk. And, you know, if you've got a base valuation, you can then look at all sorts of different sensitivities, whether it be that, be that you know, moving the construction cost, you know, pu pushing out the time, um, et cetera. But, you know, being, giving you informed uh, advice is, is probably the best we we can do you know we we, we don't um and, and a valuer cannot try and preempt the market going forward in um in a challenging uh, environment yeah and, and, I, and i think that's right and you know we we know looking back historically what what assets and ge geographies and types of property perform best and perform worst in such downturns you know and then we use that to shape our risk assessments um you know and there are some very resilient subsectors of the residential market that perform well um in in downturns and there are some that perform badly and you know some will as you know some some will be down five percent some will be down 35 percent and, and that comes back to the underwriting and certainly from from Fortwell's point of view you know we would unlikely lens against um, an asset class which could be so volatile to downturn is probably not something that we pursue as not as any opportunity. We probably more gravitate towards those sort of those subsectors that show a high level of resilience. And I think all I'd add on on these general themes is you know, that this is this is going back to what Nicola said. This is a more of a it's, it's a bit of a, a pause hiatus, and it's very difficult to assess value. What we can probably all sit here with some level of um, surety. I uh, believe is that you know there will be a gravitation back to a more normal market. You know, people will need to sell, sites will need to be sold, equity will need to invest to make return for their equity investors, be it private individuals, be it pension funds. You know, so people will want to buy sites. There will be sellers because funds have redemptions. You know, house builders have a lot of stock. They will need to sell stock in order to manage their own position. So you know, we will get back to a, a market which is normal. That might be three months. That might be eighteen months. You know, that that is the unknown. Think, you know just take a look at COVID-19 you know COVID-20 might come along at the end of the year and, and we're having this conversation with no further forward but assuming it doesn't you know we should have some belief that oh, this will get back to some semblance of normality at some point in the future. I, I certainly agree with the um, with, with the pause um, but, it, but interestingly and it, this is a bit of positivity um, since uh, uh, the, the outbreak of um, COVID, our, our, our land team uh, within London has sold, um, exchanged, exchanged um, nine sites at a value of about 146 million. So, you know, that there, there is some activity out there. Um, I have a quick question just from our readers as well, just follow on from this, um, Michael, that the um, there is a hardening professional indemnity insurance market at the moment for property surveyors. Um, quite a few uh, surveyors were um, supposed to um, renew in March, um, but because the market is becoming a bit difficult to renew, uh, what impact will this have if we have fewer surveyors in the space? It means we can um, maintain and push up our valuation, please. Um, on the on the uh, the insurance uh, point. Um, and I'm not, this isn't really my field, but cu currently premiums on insurance are not, um, not increasing as a result of uh, COVID. Um, I think if there are less surveyors in the market, um, then it's gonna, it, it probably will have an impact on, on the timing of some transactions. And you know, I was joking a moment ago about valuation fees, but they will probably be pushed, pushed upwards. But um, I think they've been pretty, Hard, hard done by um, over the last few years anyway, but um, I, I, I think it would just cause a delay, but in, in the scale of a, a standard property transaction, not a great deal of impact. 